Holder May has a title that most of us would kill for in our organizations. He is the Vice President for Advanced Concepts at Airbus. Advance us, Holder. Yeah. Thank you. Well, some walk, some sit, I stand. So um, <clears throat> I want to talk about two points, basically, and illustrate them a little bit. One is society and the interrelationship of um, high tech, in particular artificial intelligence with society and then with the economy and the digitalization of economy. So um, <clears throat> the first point is, of course, um, the relationship of uh, freedom and security as it is related to surveillance and control, which we all experience happens every day all the time, more and more. Now, freedom and security is not a trade-off relationship, as it's often being put. You have total security, no freedom, or total freedom, no security. I think without a certain degree of security, we probably have no freedom and cannot enjoy any freedom. The freedom of the people in the World Trade Center was to either jump out of the window or get burned, and that's, of course, not the freedom we mean. Um, there are sometimes, in some um, countries uh, after sunset, two groups of people in the streets, criminals and victims. And uh, that's also not uh, the um, freedom we want. So we have to look into the question of how we structure and organize all our societies, be it China, be it the West, whatever, in this relationship of security and freedom. Now, I want you to imagine 5 p.m. rush hour in Paris, Washington, or any big city, and you walk through the streets. What do you see? Almost every intersection is blocked because people drive into the intersection although they cannot pass. It is because they are unattentive or just selfish and ruthless, whatever, but it doesn't work. Now, you have the autonomous car and the artificial intelligence-based traffic control system, and you can easily imagine that this problem will be solved. There will be a smooth flow of traffic and it, and it works. So far, so good, until a person, a pedestrian, steps onto the street. Now the car will stop. What does this person learn? Hey, I can walk onto the street whenever I want and all traffic stops. So we will experience a complete breakdown of traffic because of the behavior of people. Now, there are two ways to deal with it. Either you program the car in a way that it uh, once in a while overruns the pedestrians and they learn to pay attention, or you have video surveillance anyway everywhere, and there is, um, of course, biometric data recognition, and you step onto the street, and then you will read on your mobile device, well, we just deducted 1,000 euros from your account. If you do that again, it will be 5,000. If you do it once more, you will be in prison for one month. So we learn to behave, right? Now, the individual in the past was doing a crime or a terror act, whatever. It was a very regional, probably only local event. But with the empowerment of people, in particular with modern technology, be it, be it biological weapons, be it cyber weapons, be it misbehavior in a, in a society, in a in a structure and an environment which is networked, you have cascading effects. So the impact will be significant, and now it's about the relationship between the individual and the collective. And I think it doesn't take much imagination that China has a clear idea about the relationship between collective and individual as we have, and it's probably a little bit different, but it's important to talk about it and to understand that no matter what society, we have to have to talk about this relationship and how we balance individual and collective. Now, I have argued that security is a prerequisite for freedom. This is, is clear in the social, I mean, if you have hunger, you don't ask for freedom of press, as we have heard from Marxists before, but this also applies to the security in the streets. Now, how does a collective protect against individuals who misbehave? And how to protect the individual, of course. Now, I think we should start thinking about something which my friend Parakana argued so nicely. We need probably to adapt all our societies to that in a way to think about a combination of Switzerland and Singapore. Switzerland, because you discuss locally about fundamental issues, important issues, values, and Singapore because you have the very best technocrats working in the government. 
And, you know, I think we have to creatively think about it because only the combination will probably do it. Now, um, the economy. We all know the answer is digitalization, but what was the question? It is, I think, about turning art into science at the moment. It is engineering art, not science. It's the art of war. It's um, the art of cooking. Now, if you go to a restaurant with a, as a three-star Michelin chef and he cooks a wonderful dish and he gives you the recipe, you have the recipe in your hands and you go back to the kitchen and cook the same thing, exactly what is written on paper, it will be a nice dish, but not as good as the dish from the three-star Michelin cook, cook, the chef. Why is this so? Because documentation is never complete, and there is something which has to do with feeling, experience, whatever. So you read there is, take a little bit of salt, but what is a little bit? Now, if this is digitalized, it is a precise number. We call it production data. If you have the production data, you know how to do it precisely and exactly as the three-star Michelin cook. So how can Germany in the future export Audi, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, if everybody, at least most of the countries, can produce the car in exactly the same quality because it is based on a digitalized production where you have the production data at some stage. Steal it, buy it, you know, have spies, whatever. Um, the problem is how can we make sure that we stay ahead in a sense? And the interesting thing that invention only helps very shortly because if you're an artist, a sculpturist, and you make a nice sculpture, if you put it into the 3D printer, you have two million originals. It's not distinguishable anymore. So Germany invented the Telefax, but Japan produced the Telefaxes and marketed it and made the money. Even if you are like in China for a long time, just a copycat economy, you make the money not by just inventing things, you make it by doing the application and sell it. Sell it. So the problem is that we are challenged with innovation and high quality manufacturing as we move into the digitalization, which is of course without alternative, but nevertheless, it will be a big, big challenge. Now I think um, the problem with the intelligence in this whole part is I'm not so much concerned about artificial intelligence, I'm more concerned about human stupidity. The question how we use this. And I think if we think it through, it's not about intelligence per se, that doesn't necessarily do us any good, as we see with many modern autocrats and, and dictators in history, they were not necessarily stupid. But it is related to a civilization, to culture, to values, to the question of reason and reasoning. And that is something where we might still have a certain competitive advantage to very intelligent machines. As I argued two years ago here at the same place, that um, referring to Ray Kurzweil, who wrote an article about 20 years ago, and the title was so wonderful. The title was, The Computers Will Convince Us That We Are Superfluous. And if we don't one day end up in a zoo and little robot babies make fun of us, we better start thinking about our own role as human beings and how we use artificial, so-called artificial intelligence for the good, which is related to culture and civilizations. I think we need this debate in all of our societies. We call our, our different societies. We'll deal with this challenge differently. Thank you very much. Thank you.